if, if you're thinking about this as, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. It might just be like 2008, 2009. We go through it. We have this V-shaped recovery, and it's kind of business as usual. I'm not yeah. worried about it. I'm just going to buy the dip. You don't, you don't understand that this is a whole new animal. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the reset that frankly has already begun. And I would like to welcome you to this edition of Coffee with Lynette with our very I, I'm so excited about this guest today, George Gammon. He is a macro addict and he is brilliant. He's an American real estate investor and entrepreneur. He retired early, so he knows how to find, uh, to find advantages and to find opportunities in crisis. His YouTube channel has over 66,000 subscribers and growing very rapidly. And his, his videos are designed to build wealth and help you thrive in a world of economic insanity. And quite frankly, things are pretty darn insane these days. I am so excited to have him here. He is, I, I know this is going to be a fabulous interview. So without further ado, George, I am so glad that you're here today. And, you know, I really wanted you to come because our last conversation that we had on your channel, you're, you're so bright, you're so spot on. And everybody, all of my viewers, all of our viewers really need to hear what you have to say about what really is the crisis that we're dealing with here? This is crazy. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I appreciate the kind words, Lynette. I don't know if, uh, you know, my father always said I was a legend in my own mind. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want that. people to think I'm, uh, I'm not that great, but uh, I definitely oh, obsess yes. over this stuff and I really enjoy talking about it. And hopefully if I can provide an insight every once in a while, then I'm doing my job. Uh, well, I would say that you're doing your job very well if that's all you're looking for. But if you haven't visited George's site, you need to. All the links are below. And let's just jump right into it because we're, yeah. right, in, we're right in the middle of this coronavirus erupting as a pandemic globally. But what do you see as the real problem here? Well, the real problem is that we're in the everything bubble. And so that has so many systemic risks. And I think it, it uh, to be clear, I, th I'm not, I have no proof of this, but it would make sense to me that we're not getting correct information. They're not testing like they should. I'm talking about they in the United States. Just because they know how precarious the U.S. economy is. And so if, if we didn't have all of these asset bubbles that have been created by the Federal Reserve, I think they'd be doing more testing. I think they'd be more honest, uh, the World Health Organization, in really what's going on uh, specifically in the United States. But I think that they're just kind of, they've got this counterbalance between yeah, okay. do you really tell the truth and risk economic collapse or do you just kind of try to sweep it under the rug, hopefully no one notices because we're not testing, and then try to prevent what they know is, um, well, they might know that it's, uh, they might not think that it's inevitable, but I think that people like you and I that pay attention to that stuff would, uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yes, and, and I would say that that's really always been the truth because if people actually understood how money was created and supported in the system and therefore what you're working for, what you're trying to save, what you're trying to invest, that they would say no. So I would say that that's the, you know, the same kind of thing that's been part of their playbook forever, but it doesn't look like it's really working anymore. 
I mean, look what happened. You know, the whole world, all the markets, I should say, were waiting for what the G7, that's the group of the largest global economies, that they came together with a firepower. And when right. Powell came out and did a 50 basis point cut saying that it was a preventative measure because the U.S. economy is so strong, it was really interesting to watch the reaction with the markets going straight up, but then look at what's happened since. Yeah, I think last time I checked, it's down 400 or 450 points, and that's with a 50 point basis or 50 uh, basis uh, 50, 50 basis point cut. Right. And uh, my goodness, so where I where mine mine goes next is that. We've assumed over the last 12 years that the Fed has control to a certain degree over the markets. And the U.S. economy has become so financialized that it's really not the market being a reflection of the economy, but the economy being propped up by the markets. So since the Fed has had control over the markets through lowering of interest rates and quantitative easing, it's everything works out. and. We all sleep well at night knowing that if anything happens, if we go down by 10, 15, 20 percent, the Fed can just come right in with their put and then you know it's right back to the races. The problem with that is that if the Fed does one of these rate cuts or tries to prop up the market through the rate cuts or quantitative easing and it doesn't work, and then, then what do you do? Because the only tools that the Fed has at its disposal is just money printing and lowering interest rates. So if those are your only two tools and they don't work and the market says, you know what, we're sick and tired of this money printing, it's not gonna work this time, the coronavirus or XYZ is more powerful, we're, we're more worried about the coronavirus than we are optimistic about the money printing propping up the markets. When, when that tidal wave takes over the money printing and their only tools, then how does the market stay up? Then it goes back to the market's got to trade on the underlying fundamentals. Right. And as you know, being a market participant and expert for as long as you have been, the, the, the delta between the fundamentals and where the market's trading right now is absolutely massive and I'm I, I would guess that if we actually traded down to call it a what a 15 PE ratio I'd assume that's the historic oh, average you know is. better than I would mm -hmm. going from a 30 PE uh, on the Cape ratio down to a 15 I mean does that take us down to what 15,000 on the Dow take us down to a exactly. thousand maybe under on the S&P and then what does that do to the economy because the economy has been so financialized, like I said earlier, and is so propped up by financial assets. It just, it's this daisy chain reaction. And I think it might have started today at 10 o'clock Eastern time when the Fed dropped and the market just said, you know what, we're still going down. Right, exactly. And, and you know, any con game requires confidence. So you have yeah. to have confidence that, I mean, what can the Federal Reserve do about this anyway? But but when they drop those rates, 50 basis points, that means they used up of more of their bullets and they don't have that right. many left. I think they're between uh, on the Fed funds rate 125 and 150. Well, uh, you know, how do you go below zero? The EU has tried it, even though the president wants us to go negative, and, and I'm certain we are gonna go negative. But I think that the negative rate debt has ballooned, ballooned back up to like 16 trillion. And what is that all? What is all of that telling you? That's telling you crisis. You know, Powell came yeah. out and said we're doing it to, you know, just we don't really need it. The economy, the U.S. economy is so strong. So we're only doing it to prevent something, except that any time they've done it at this large level, it has been because we've been in a crisis. You think it's going to prevent yeah. the economy from slowing? Yeah, I, I, I want to, yeah, I think you brought up some great points right there. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to address is the Fed and their rationale for doing this. And so 
they'll come out and say, well, we're doing this to, you know, just a buffer, just to put in kind of a safety net there. But they're only dropping interest rates from 1.5 percent down to 1 percent. So, I mean, is anybody, especially with the coronavirus out there where you don't want to send your kid to school? There's mm -hmm. I've seen all these long lines at Costco and Sam's Clubs to stock up on groceries. I've seen um, a lot of clips on Twitter where people are on flights where they're literally the only person on the plane. Like wow. It's just yeah. them. They've got the whole plane to themselves. So is, is this 50 basis point cut really going to have an effect on that type of psychology? And, I, you know, the, the answer, I think, has got to be no. So exactly. that takes them down to zero. I think you get the same thing. And then you could say, well, but they could always do quantitative easing. And this is the second point that I wanted to address. But let's not forget that they've basically been doing quantitative easing since September 17th when they had the repo blow up. So they, they've been purchasing 60, uh, 60 to, or was it 50 to 60 billion worth of treasuries since that repo blow up that's basically quantitative easing yes. so so if they come in you know what do they do from there so say they're buying 60 billion a month right now do they take that up to 100 do they take that up to 200 maybe but it's it's the same story that if they do that and at some point the market says you know what we're just not playing this game anymore and regardless of how much qe or how much you want to expand your balance sheet we're still going down then there, there's no more safety net. There's no more Fed put. And you've got the market still at its second uh, highest valuation. I read a tweet yep. by a gal that I follow on Twitter. She's fantastic. She's on Real Vision all the time. Her name is Stephanie Pomboy. Mm -hmm. And she made the point after uh, the Friday morning, uh, you know, after we had that horrible week, that the market was still extremely overvalued. When you look at the market cap relative to GDP, which is a fantastic chart that I'd uh, I'd really right. suggest all your, your viewers checking out. But you can see that in all these times when, uh, you know, like the eight, the early 80s as an example, just to give it some context, the, the market cap to GDP was about 30% or so. As of recently, we've gone over, I think it's 150%. And just because yep. we had that, uh, that, that drop last week of call it 12%, we're still at like 140 and you compare that to when stocks were actually cheap, and then you can see how much downside we actually have. I, I don't know. I mean, you would know this a lot better than than I would, but I would guess that we've got at least 50% uh, of downside if the market doesn't respond to what the Fed is doing. Yeah, but you know what really has me concerned? Because inside of all of this, remember next year, I, they may change their minds after this, but they're getting rid of LIBOR. So the system uh -huh. itself is dying into this. And my concern is not as much if the markets keep going down, though that could maybe wake some people up. My concern is when, because I think we're in the melt-up part of this phase, when right. all of these global central bankers just print all of that money, it has to go someplace. And it's going to go in a targeted way. So, you know, yeah, what we're seeing right now is a loss of confidence. But when they all turn those money printing spigots on and we see the markets going back up and straight up to the moon, people will cheer if they're not living through a crisis themselves. They'll cheer because the markets look like they're going higher. But the piece that they'll be missing is that the value of that currency, it's lost all value. Right, and it yeah. doesn't have very much anyway. And then when they lop off those zeros, like we saw in Venezuela, market goes from here, best performing market, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, until boom, when yeah, they well, just lopped term. off. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I can go up in nominal terms, but still go down in real terms, as can housing, all asset prices can. I think that's what you're referring to. It's exactly. just, um, yeah, it's it's a situation where I don't know how, you know, I, I have done a couple videos this week and I, I've uh, put out some tweets where 
and I, th I think this is the best way that I can describe it. It's the way I see it in my mind. And that is that the Federal Reserve and the government is on one side. You have this battle going on. And mm -hmm. the battle is the Federal Reserve and the government versus reality. And, <laughs> and so, you know, this, today yeah. you chalk one up for reality in the sense that the market went down even though the Fed came out and tried to uh, create more confidence by dropping those interest rates. I saw also uh, this morning I tweeted out that uh, Japan is considering postponing the Olympics yes. as a result of the coronavirus. That would be another point for reality. So, you, you know, the, I'm assuming Trump is going to come out today or they're, they're going to do something to try to talk up these markets and, and provide that confidence that you talk about all the time. But right. I think that's the last piece of the puzzle. Oh, and wow. if, if the government and the Fed lose that battle and reality wins, then I it goes back to what I was saying earlier. I, I don't see how the, the markets recover from that. Um, but, but And then a lot of it is predicated upon how bad this coronavirus gets. I, I think it's a lot worse in the United States. They're just not testing. And um, hopefully it, it, it slows down and when we get to the summer months. I'm assuming that it will. But if it doesn't, then we've, we've got some even bigger problems. And if it does, maybe that confidence goes back over to the Fed and the government and that money printing actually does prop up the markets. So there's a lot of moving pieces there right now. Yeah, there are a lot of moving pieces. But, you know, it's been really interesting just to watch this unfold because last week I had said, okay, next week we're going to look at what all the different central bankers are doing. And it is the World Bank with the IMF saying we're going to do whatever it takes. It is the EU. It is the Bank of Japan. It is China. Everybody is saying we will do whatever it takes. And what, what I'd really like people to see is look at their own lives. And at any point when they said to themselves, we will do at all cost is really where it is. I will make this happen at all cost. The cost is typically extremely dear and yeah. not really worth that. And but, the cost is usually the currency to your point. That exactly. And part of what I've been just uh, like I went through the OC. OECD report. I went through an IMF report, so I've been reading a lot of the reports that are coming out, and they're starting to talk about um, basically helicopter money. Oh, they yeah. didn't say helicopter money, but you know, people. There are some that have recouped since the crisis that hit in 2008, but the reality is, is the system died. So if you've got 42% of the population that can't come up with 400 bucks in an emergency, my bet is they are the working poor. And if they aren't working, they aren't getting paid. So, you know, I mean, that's really where it's, they're not going in to buy the stock market. So I do think we can see the stock market rising like we have in Venezuela, right? Yeah, right. Best, yeah, best but market, but the economy is in shambles. Yeah, I, I think it's it's great for your viewers if we unpack what you just said a little bit further. Please. When you're talking about the ECB and the Bank of Japan doing whatever it takes. I'm sure those those are their words. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, that's great, but what can you do? Like like the Bank of Japan as an example. What I don't even understand where they're going with that. Like, like, who are they trying to kid? They're already negative. They've already bought, what, 80% of the ETFs? They basically exactly. own the bond market. What, and what the are you stock gonna market. Do? Yeah, what, what, what are you going to do? You own every single asset. You, you, I mean, and then the only other option is the MMT option and just helicopter money. Helicopter and, money. And then just hoping that that works. I think that would work a lot better and you got to define well, work. I think that well, would create more inflation in the U.S. than it would Japan. But uh, I think we're going to get to a point here. We could, especially if the coronavirus continues to expand and get worse, that they're backed up into a corner where they're at the zero bound or even negative. They're doing as much quantitative easing as they can do, and it's still not working. And then it's just a Hail Mary with MMT because that's the only thing that they can possibly do that they haven't already tried. And 
it, then it's a really interesting thought experiment to say, well, will it work? Because right now there's the financial economy and the real economy, and there's a, a, a defined line mm-hmm. that it's very hard for that money to get from the financial economy over into the real economy because your transfer mechanism, it, or the commercial banks themselves, and if they're not lending or if people, if there's no demand for loans, then that money, no matter how much uh, reserves are parked at the Fed. You know, we could have 1.5 and uh, trillion in excess reserves. That won't matter for the real economy. You won't get the increase in the velocity that's needed to increase oh. inflation to at least get interest rates up or to do something to make this uh, uh, seem like the economy is moving in the right direction. So how? You know, if they can get over that line in the sand and get that money or those reserves somehow into the real economy, do people spend it? Do they hoard it? I mean, going back to 2008, 2009, when we got into the depths of the recession, people weren't out there spending money frivolously. They were actually drawing down debt. They were paying down debt. They were improving their balance sheet. So if we have helicopter money, and instead of going out just spending it wildly at the movie theater or buying a new car, people actually pay off their debt, which decreases the money supply, decreases right. velocity, and improve their balance sheet, then maybe that doesn't work either. Well, I'm, I'm thinking the MMT, so that is just that helicopter money where they're just putting money into the hands of anybody that yeah. might spend it. So these are lower income people. But, you know, how much debt can somebody that is, you know, in a pure service sector, I mean, we have destroyed our middle class, we have destroyed our foundation, and all of these things that are happening right now is really a big test. It's a test to the ETFs, which which have risen dramatically, and an ETF is a derivative since the financial crisis, and it permeates everything. And the huge swings that we're seeing in these markets, I mean, thousand point swings or more are really all about the algorithms. I mean, yeah, 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 I agree. And also, I had an interview the other day with Grant Williams. Yes, I saw that. It was excellent. Yeah, he's just incredible. Yes. And he brought up a fantastic point that since we've been in the longest expansion of U- in U.S. history, over the past, call it 12 years, it's created this unique environment where the market participants, a lot of the market participants, really have never seen a downturn. And if you right. think back, going back to the last crisis that we had starting in 2007, okay, but we were only about six or seven years removed from the dot-com bust. So okay, it's kind of fresh in people's memory. And then you go back, then you had the SNL crisis, and then you had uh, long-term capital management blow up, and you had all these things. Then going back to our last conversation in, in 87 with Black Monday. So you have these periodic things that happen, let's say five, six years apart, but then all of a sudden we go 12 years, you have this recency bias, then a larger percentage of those market participants are maybe these younger people that only know one thing, and that's buy the dip. Exactly. That's, that's the only strategy that you need is buy the dip and you're going to be golden. And as you and the I... central banks propping the markets up, pushing them even, up. Yeah, they might not even connect those dots. They just know that... Uh, and I'm talking about more retail right. investors. Like right. you and I are, are, are active on YouTube. So I watch a lot of these videos from um, YouTube calm experts that are on investing and whatnot, and every single one of them, uh, well, for the most part, says the, the same thing, and that's that every time the market goes down, it's your buying opportunity. So the market just went down by a thousand points today. Well, that's a great opportunity to go in and buy Tesla. That's a great yeah. opportunity to go in and buy Uber or something like that. You're, it's a gift. This is a Christmas gift come early because we know. Then this is, of course, their words, not mine. We right. know that the market over time always goes up over time. And it's this mentality that's bizarre to me because what they do is they go back to 1981 and they only look at the last 40 years when we've been in a down cycle 
of interest rates. Exactly. And just extrapolate that out for the next 400 years as though, and then they, but then they don't look at 1925 or 1929 to 1981, where if you look at the market for, in those years adjusted for inflation, the market's flat. Right. It, it's totally flat. And then it just becomes a matter of timing when you got in, when you didn't. And it's it's in another example of this I like to use is Japan. And that why is the United stock market, the United States stock market exclusive? Like, like, why is it so special? Why can't we be like Japan? If we can do QE for the next 20 years and keep interest rates at zero, why can't our stock market go from an all time high down 50 percent and never recover? Why can't our housing market do that? Because that's exactly what happened, happened in, in Japan. Japan. People that use Jap uh, Japan as a reference point, they always like to cherry pick whatever data they want to use. <laughs> they say, oh, the Fed can do QE forever because Japan did it. The, uh, the Fed can take <laughs> interest rates negative forever because Japan did it. But then they, they forget about what I was just saying about the markets going down by 50%. So that's another big... I don't want to call it a black swan, but a, another variable out there that Grant pointed out oh, that I think okay. we really need to think about is is look at the market participants and the algorithms, to your point. You've got algorithms. You've got people that have just been buying the dip and will continue to do that and have been doing that over the last 12 years. And you've got the pension funds that have gone further and further out the risk oh, curve because God. they can't get yield anywhere else, right? Yep. And then you you add that to the fact where people have gone from active management almost exclusively into passive, passive. management and these ETFs that to your point are a derivative and I, I mean I it, it well <laughs> enough said <laughs> enough said but you know this is what's bringing us into this new financial system and a lot of my work is based upon being able to make those educated choices because their goal is to stay in power. They've created this mess and they want to continue to create this mess. What I've also seen um, oh, over the last maybe month-ish or so ago are central banks now coming out and asking the public, well, what do you want us to be like? What should we do? I mean, it's because yeah, Christy, they... Regard. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. When I see that, it's like, oh, it, it, if I could reach through and throttle these people because they've done such a bad job of it by design. And, you know, you really have to wonder, do they realize how much damage they're really doing to the normal person? Or do they just live in the numbers that they juggle and create and, and shift and massage so that it looks like they want it to look? They, I, yeah, personally, I think they just live in a world of, of models. I, and, I, and, and, and that's the only, I, I, I don't, I would hate to think that they're malicious in their intent. I don't know, but I would, I would, let's uh, give them the benefit would, of the doubt. I, I, I'll do that. <laughs> okay, you I, can do that I, for I, me. I'll do that. You know, because here's the other piece. If you yeah. look around the world, what do we hear about employment? These are the lowest levels in 30 years and 50 years. Everybody is employed that wants to be employed. And I don't care whether you're looking at the U.S. or the U.K. or the E.U. or Japan or China. Everybody's got that same song. And so the consumer is so strong. But if 42% of the population can't come up with 400 bucks, right. and with those debt rising more and more so lowering the interest rate to inspire more debt taking taking on yeah. more debt i mean yeah they're pushing I, on a string they're, they're, absolutely. they're pushing on a string yeah they've pulled as much demand forward from the future as they possibly can and um it's you the the quite you know it's, it's interesting because you've got so many of these scenarios that could play out whether it's uh inflation whether it's an inflationary depression, right? Like like we were talking that's, about before. That's, that's what whether I think it's, it's going to look like. Whether it's like. just the CPI going up, whether it's just uh, you know you have the CPI going up while you have asset prices in in total deflation. Uh, could you see just outright deflation? It's just this Rubik's cube that's always changing. W one thing I wanted to mention though, going back to the unemployment rate, because that's the the hat that the mainstream always kind of puts 
you know, that, that, that they throw out there is saying, oh, well, of course the economy is amazing because we've got the lowest unemployment rate of all time. But the, the unemployment rate is very similar to the uh, CPI in the sense that if they adjusted it the same way that they did back in the 1970s and the back in the 1980s, it would be much, much higher. Uh, yes. If it's call it 3.5 percent right now, if they adjusted it the same way, it would be closer to six or seven percent. So it really kind of or maybe even 10, maybe closer to 10. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the CPI, you look at shadow stats and right. that's up there around 10 percent, close to where we had it in the 1970s. And I think inflation is, is a very tough thing to pin down because it all depends on what you spend your money on. And unfortunately, when you look at the stuff that rich people spend their money on, as far as the majority of, of the money that they actually do spend, it's really not on things that have gone up that much in price. But when you get down to the middle class and, and, the, and the poor people, well, the, the stuff that they spend 95% of their income on has gone up dramatically in price. So it's, it's, it just goes back to what you're saying. You know, one thing, though, I want to point out, because mm -hmm. if you look at what's going on right now, last week, the coronavirus and, and what we've been talking about today, it, it, it looks really, really bad. And I don't see how they, they navigate their way out of this unless, unless they get a rapid cure for the coronavirus or the, the hot weather knocks it out, something like that. But I want to point out an opportunity. I did a video yesterday. And as stock prices go down, I'm not suggesting anyone buy right now, not even close, because like Stephanie said, it's still at, at ridiculous so valuation. Yeah. But, but what I'm doing personally is I'm just starting a watch list on, mm -hmm. on saying, OK, if the market went down by 50 percent from where it is today, what would I like to own? And what would be interesting? You know, what would I, I like to buy as far as a dividend? This doesn't necessarily apply specifically to the United States, but all over the world. And um, if you have that global view, I think you have a huge advantage. But that's what I've done. Assuming that you've got uh, you've got gold as an insurance policy and uh, for a, a speculation, you know, I like the, the miners and I, I like some other plays like that. But for the I for me personally, I like to have the bulk of my portfolio in investments and how I define that as something that would pay me to own it. So whether that's a rental property or a dividend paying stock. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that anyone buy right now, but I am suggesting maybe starting a watch list. And that's uh, maybe a way that I could put a positive spin on our well, conversation. Here. It, actually, I was going to talk to you about that because you did do a video on um, finding opportunities in crisis. And yep. the strategy that we execute here is also about finding those opportunities. And, and if you're in the right place at the right time with the right asset, the right money, then yep. you can take advantage of them. With so it's it, more the it. patterns, right? Um, and that's why I talk about the patterns all the time. I mean, you know, frankly, as an ex stockbroker, I have a very high level of comfort with stocks, but I also understand when they are really out of whack. Right. So, you know, I'm going to wait until until the garbage shakes out, because can you even tell me right now? I, I think I could be off on this. Obviously, I don't have it in front of me. But if I remember correctly, one in four companies on the exchange are classified as zombie companies. I could be off by that. I'll, I'll research it and I'll, I'll pull that data up and look. But what that means is that they aren't even making enough income to cover their debt or interest payments. So they're borrowing money to service that debt. You yeah. really have to do your due diligence. Yeah, and that come, now you're talking about the corporate bond market as well. Correct. And, uh, oh, my gosh. That's probably the, the, the biggest uh, bubble waiting to go. But I, I, I'll, I really like what you say about gold. I've heard a few, of your, a few of your videos where you talk about, you know, maybe stockpiling some gold as an insurance policy. Then if we do get this inflation, I mean, you could potentially pay off your mortgage. Exactly. With, uh, an, who knows? An ounce of gold. I, I don't know who what, knows? Maybe a tenth. Inflation we get. As long as it's fixed rate, you got exactly, it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, the historic average is 25 ounces of gold or the equivalent okay. would buy an entire city block buildings and all. Huh. Wow. Right. So yeah. 
Absolutely, because when they reset the system, and that's what, you know, for me, that's what the this Black Swan, event, this does look like the Black Swan. We'll yeah. see, but I, it does look like it. Because the it, basically you have China shut down right now. And I don't know if they could come up with a rapid enough movement for that. But yeah. all of those... All of those property prices, stock prices, you let all the garbage shake out, there are going to be many that do not make it because this is about leverage. But then those opportunities, and when they do that reset, they revalue the gold. So what's up here is overvalued right now and down here with the gold and silver that are undervalued. Well, that flip-flops. Yeah. Then, and, and, the, and the great thing about gold and silver is it's, it's extremely liquid. Exactly. And so it, it's it's like keeping dry powder for people who like to hold their money in cash or just you know however much of that portfolio it is. I say that um, if you really want dry powder and you don't want to touch your gold, which I don't suggest doing, you go into just short term T bills like maybe a three month T bill. Just keep rolling it over so you don't have a lot of risk there. But but I want to I want to <laughs> yeah. have a caveat to that that if interest rates continue to go down and we could get to a point where the whole yield curve is potentially negative right then then, then your dry powder you really want all not only your insurance but i would say your dry powder you want that in gold as well because it, it really it really flip-flops then and a lot of people have assets that on paper look great right now, and they say, "Oh, I don't have a problem if you know if the market goes down by 20% or 50%, right. I can go ahead and liquidate this asset. I can sell my house. I can take out an equity line of credit against uh, my a rental property, whatever it is." But they don't realize, and and I know this from experience because I started investing in real estate in 2012, right at the bottom of the market, and that's mm -hmm. when real estate, no one wanted to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Yep. And I had pristine credit. I, I was a, a, a great credit risk, and I couldn't get a loan from the bank. I, they wouldn't even, anything involving real estate, there's just no way they would not do it. And so my point with that is that no matter how bad it gets with this coronavirus or anything else, any other black swan, you know that your gold and silver, you're going to be able to liquidate that and take that money or whatever it is and turn it into an asset that you might want to buy at that point in time. It's just an asset swap on your balance sheet, but gold gives you that optionality, that liquidity optionality that other assets, uh, it doesn't give you. But I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Well, you are, but I, I couldn't have said it better myself. So thank you really, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, that's what it is. You just want to get out of the way. Let whatever's going to happen, happen. Because we can't stop it. You know, but I do also feel so strongly that we need to have the food, the water, the energy, yeah, right. the security, that barterability, wealth preservation, and community. You know, if this is indeed the Black Swan event, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and she has a little plot in the community garden. Yeah. And she's learning how. She says, I was really never much of a gardener, but I'm really learning how to do that now. So for anybody that's out there, you know, there are community gardens all over the place. Make sure that you can secure your food because, you know, you saw what happened when you go to these big box stores or the grocery store. You know, if people aren't panicking when they do, boom, it can go away like that. Because yeah. most and people don't have a store of food. That's right. And this is a whole different type of panic in that we right. could face in the United States. We, you know, we think of panic as 2008 or 2009, but th that's not a good comparison because no. we didn't have any supply shocks back right. then like we could potentially have now with what's going on with the coronavirus. So exactly. I, I mean, I, I see all these videos. I have uh, friends of mine from all over the world texting me saying, you know, look at, I just went to the grocery store to try to stock up on XYZ and it's just out. I remember one guy uh, texted me a picture of the, the pasta aisle at his grocery store. Oh, wow. Completely Interesting. Completely sold out. Completely sold out. And, and that's just people preparing for something. Right. If it actually does hit the United States, 
like it did in uh, China or maybe still is, or South Korea, Italy, Iran, any of these places, you're not only going to have that supply shock from the standpoint of people going out and just buying everything in sight because they're preparing, but also because they cannot fill those shelves because there's nothing coming in. Most people don't realize that 50% of the supply chains in the world start with China. Mm -hmm. And not to mention the pharmaceuticals. I read something, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I read something the other day saying that 90% of the original ingredients for pharmaceuticals or drugs, drugs. For, for the, for the uh, world comes from China. So even if – and my point is that's nothing that the United States has ever seen before – Maybe right. in the Great Depression, but it's definitely not something that we saw in 2007, 2008. So if, if you're thinking about this as, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. It might just be like 2008, 2009. We go through it. We have this V-shaped recovery, and it's kind of business as usual. I'm not yeah. worried about it. I'm just going to buy the dip. You don't, you don't understand that this is a whole new animal. This is not what we saw in 2007, 2008. I hope it's not as bad, but it could potentially be a hell of a lot worse. Oh, I, it, it is quite possible. And Megan, P Megan has a lot of people that know her. Megan, what year were you in, what hurricane? Katrina. In Katrina? Oh, Katrina. Yeah, yeah, right? there you go. That's a good example. It's a great example. And can you share your experience a little bit? Loud enough so people can hear? <laughs> um, well, with Katrina, when we knew the hurricane was coming. She was in Miami. She uh -huh. was in Miami at so that time. There was obviously a lot of like stocking up, but then the aftermath was even worse because we didn't have electricity for three weeks. So there, there was go. no perishable food. Gas was being rationed because even though we didn't have power, um, a lot of the infrastructure was still pretty bad, but we still had to go to work. So we still had to use our cars and we needed gas to get there. We needed gas to get places. Because it's like business as usual, even though it's not business as usual. So I right. did in gas ration lines, and um, it was worse, much worse after the hurricane than it was before. And we were still feeling the effects before the hurricane. Yeah, that's my point. Exactly. Right on the money. And so I think it goes back to what you're saying and what you've been preaching for so long is you not only have the gold, not only think smart about your investments, but also be wise about your personal life in the same way. Maybe grow some of your own food. Maybe do some of these things that uh, you're, you're, looking, um, you're looking pretty smart right now, Lynette. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you know, here's the thing. I actually believe my research, you yeah. know. There you go. And you're practicing it as well. So you're you're good to go. We could have this thing come through Phoenix and you're just going to go right out to your backyard and get some more of that uh, that sugar cane lemonade or whatever. Yes, and that just sugar watch cane it all go by. <laughs> yeah, well, and hopefully also, you know, be able to share. Actually, here, can you hand me a bag? Or Well, I brought a whole bunch of produce in today. So oh, from your garden? to share. Is that from yes. Your garden? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, Jeez. so and eggs and things like that. So yeah, nice good greens that I'm gonna be sharing with others in the office and taking over to donate. So yeah, wow, I definitely practice, cool. yeah, I definitely practice what I preach, but I think everybody needs to be able to do that on, on some level, maybe not the way I have, but one of my favorite suggestions, honestly, is to get some really good broccoli sprouting seeds. Because you rinse them off three days, you have live food that is super nutritious. So if you're going to be limited on your food, uh, you know, that is a great way to provide nutrition for your body. Holds, yeah. You know, not very expensive, doesn't take up a lot of space. Probably not, people aren't thinking about that at the grocery store when they're, you know, buying stuff off the shelf. And it's got a great long shelf life. So. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you're actually looking at for the rest of this week as far as the markets. Like, what are you paying most attention to? What do you think is the most important thing that we can focus on to really take that information and be able to leverage it to maybe prepare ourselves better from a financial standpoint? I say you got to look at the interest rates. You yeah. know, it, it isn't just the inversions, but you've got the 10-year. I don't know where it is at the moment, but it was just a hair above 1%. Uh, 
Um, so the central banks are, are out of the dry powder, but globally there's a lot more inversions that's happening. And that's really, and, and the bond market is a much bigger market. And that yeah. bond bubble is a much bigger bubble. So, yeah. but I, I, I hate to say this piece, you know, you never let a good crisis go to waste. What have we got going on here? We've got the LIBOR ending next year. We've got the uh, problem with uh, all of the retirees, you know, people retiring. They don't have money to retire. So, yeah. and they've been shifting the risk. I mean, that's one thing that I've been watching so closely and showing people over time since 2008, how they propped up the markets to give the elite a chance to get out of harm's way. And it's just like all the government bonds. Who's really been buying the lion's share of them? The pension plans. Yeah. You know, and that's the biggest bubble that there is. So, I mean, yeah. I really hate to say this, but this crisis could justify the shift into the next monetary system. Yeah, because you've got the, the demographic issue there as well with the, the majority of the baby boomers retiring right about now. So they're, they're taking their money out of risk assets. They're spending it or they're using that for their uh, consumption. And so that takes one of the buyers out of the markets. And then going back to the pension funds, if, uh, if they can't get a return, then what are they going to do? Well, they're in order to meet their obligations, they're going to try to increase taxes, most likely property taxes. But people forget that, that what happens, what's the main driver of tax revenue as a percentage of GDP? It would be a recession, and it's the market. Uh, people think that it's, int or that it's uh, tax rates. It's, it's, it's not. It has nothing to do with it. If you look at tax rates going back to the 1950s or 40s or whenever you want to, you'll see that it's always hovered right around, well, in the modern era, it, and I would say after uh, the Depression, it's hovered right around 18% of GDP. And that doesn't matter whether the highest marginal rate's 90% or 25%. It, it's always right around there. So what happens, though, when it does dip down, that's a result of a recession. So, And you can see that happen dramatically played out in 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you think about the fact that the government right now is running a trillion dollar deficits, over trillion dollars, and then, and that's in when we're supposed to have the greatest economy of all time. So if, if, if we have a, a huge recession, something even worse or as bad as 2008, 2009, then the deficits are gonna go to the moon. I mean, I read something that Gunlock came out with the other day that uh, right around uh, 5 percent of or the deficits are running right around 5 percent of GDP right now. But in the reset, the last recession, they got up to 10 percent of GDP. Well, if that goes up to let's call it 15 percent at the same time when they they meaning the government and the pension funds need tax revenues the most, the tax revenues will be plummeting. Right. So so that, I think that's another component that people need to look at and understand. And I don't think a lot of people are, are really understanding that, especially a lot of these state workers that are in areas like New Jersey, in Illinois, California. And another uh, problem that I think people have, even if they live in a state where they think their pension is funded. You know, they'll pull up a chart or they'll pull up some sort of projections and they'll say, oh yeah, those guys in California are screwed or, or any of the states I just mentioned. And yet you're right that they are a lot more screwed. But what you don't understand is even if you're saying that you're, that even if the numbers are showing that your pension is, call it 80% funded, they're still using that 7% number on a moving forward basis. Well, how does that 7% number play out when now interest rates are potentially going negative, and exactly. we know that'll make it even harder for the pension funds to make money and the insurance company and the banks. So I get worked up here, but <laughs> the, the, what really, and you know as well as I do, the banks, the retail banks at least, are trying to make money by borrowing short lending long. There, And I had a discussion with Jeff Snyder the other day where he kind of set me straight on that, that that's not really too much what they do now as far no, as the majority of their anymore. profits, but that's still kind of the, the, the model for the community bank. Well, if, if we've got a flat yield curve or an inverted yield curve for an extended time, well, then how do they make money? And if they can't make money by retail lending, 
then how do we transfer all of the money that's being printed in the financial economy, how do we transfer that over to the real economy to get it into the hands of the people that will spend it that might actually boost the economy or boost inflation, get things going in the right direction? They're, they're not going to be able to do it if, they, if the, the transfer mechanism continues to be the banks because of their own policies. Right. Well, that's been shifting too. And I know we have, we have another discussion coming up because I want to talk to you also about what they're doing right now to start to, tr to attempt to stimulate investment into the stock market for the little guys because they need them to prop that up. But we have, we've covered so much today and I think this is really important stuff and I cannot thank you enough. I wish we could go on and on and on, but I cannot thank you enough for coming here today. You, you're so brilliant and it's just a joy to have a conversation with you. No problem, Lynette. I always enjoy it and I can't wait to do it again. We will do it very soon. We have lots more things to talk about and it's so interesting. Who knows what's going to happen day to day, but you can all rest assured that both of us will be here. Definitely, if you if you haven't gone to George's channel, the links are below. Follow him. He's brilliant. I love him. And thank you so much. Keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical metal. Definitely not papers or promises. And until yeah. next week, please be safe out there. Thank you, George. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, guys.